All right, Shalom, everybody. YouTube, Facebook, wherever else. My Hebrew is like brethren and sisters out there, even to the uh, mixed multitude. Uh, that's the, sorry to say that name, but I hate to call other people a mixed multitude because when you study the scriptures about the mixed multitude, they didn't fare very well when Israel came out of Egypt. But Shalom on this new Shabbat, uh, on the Gregorian calendar, it is the, let's see, the 15th, 15th day on Tuesday. Tuesday is the Gregorian calendar for the Shabbat. As, as obviously the, on the on Yahweh's lunar solar calendar is the Shabbat. It's the seventh day of the week. All right. Now, not everybody comes out and recollects it like that and sees it like that. Because there's some people that see the new moon as the full moon. But, uh, but from what I've studied, and looking at the lunar solar calendar, and I've studied it pretty well. Looking at the lunar solar calendar, not from a Western perspective. So, we, you know, the Yahweh's calendar ain't got nothing to do with Rome. All right. The Julian, because by the time Yahweh is on the earth, they had a calendar called the Julian calendar which was eight days, you know? Uh, so his calendar ain't got nothing to do with that calendar. They changed that calendar later to a seven day calendar because they became Christians, right? When they became Christians, they changed the calendar to a seven day calendar. And uh, we see Halal too, in the second and third century AD with the Jews that were in Rome changing, working with the Roman uh, Authorities to change the calendar there so that they, their Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath, could mix in with the Christian calendar. All right. I'm not going to, that's not my study for today. As you can see, we got up on the screen. We got up three guys from the Alabama Brawl with their, they're in custody. They've been here with their iron hands behind their back with, uh, with what is it called? Handcuffs. Um, this is why I brought this up. You know, last week I spoke about it. And uh, it's a definite, it's a definite sign of what's to come. All right, it's a definite sign of what's to come. Okay, uh, we we know everybody pretty much in the country that hasn't been living up under a rock, up under a, a, a bushel, a bush or whatever, know about the Alabama brawl, unless you're just watching just your regular news. On TV, I don't think I don't think they posted that on TV. Yet. So, the Alabama brawl. Yeah, I don't think they have that on the news. It's mostly people on the internet, social media, but it's a sign. It really is. I think Gil Scott Heron is the one that made the song. The revolution will not be televised. <laughs> At least right now, it ain't being televised. But I think it's a revolution. Part of the revolution that he was talking about. The turning of turning of, of the world upside down. As just says, the Esau the, is the end of the world that now he is. And Jacob is the beginning of that which comes after him. I think that's that's second Ezra. Uh, is it chapter six? I had to look that up, but anyway. Esau is the is the end of the world that now he is. It's, and it's the beginning. Jacob is the beginning of the world that comes after Esau. So after Esau's reign and his rulership over the earth in which he oppresses Jacob, obviously. Uh, Esau, I mean, Jacob comes in the reigning. Esau reigns, and then at the end of Esau's reign, Jacob reigns, he takes over, all right? And I bought this picture up, because really, we was looking at the, a few years ago, we was looking at the uh, 400 year, 400 year, I think it was 2019, 400 year captivity of, of of the slaves, the slaves' captivity in America, and their being here in this country. And we know that uh, Yah told Abraham that nor of a surety that thy seed should be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for 400 years. All right? So that matches up 400 years, and we see the slaves reaching America, 
Black folks, Negroes reaching Americans in slave ships. Richmond, Virginia, I believe it was, somewhere around there in 1619. All right, somewhere around August 1619. So we saw August 2019 come around and we saw some things start to happen. All right, hold on just a moment. We saw 2019 come around, we saw some things start to happen. One of the biggies was we had a, a virus, the, uh, a virus set in on us, all right? And uh, we just now just barely getting over the virus. We still got some, some uh, issues, but it's no longer, uh, no longer a, a, a trouble for us, all right? But, uh, but one thing that yeah, I said, he said, you know, because a lot of people are looking for that 400 years meaning that the Israelites would be delivered. Like Moses would just swoop in and tell Pharaoh, the leaders of the world, to let his people go. And we would jump, we would either supernaturally be taken back or through ships or however means, and we would come out with a lot of stuff. That's what a lot of people was looking for. But let's see what it says. It says, he said, no, but surely that thy seed should be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them. And they shall afflict them for 400 years. So they will serve them. That means they would be slaves. And in this slavery, they would afflict them for 400 years altogether. All right? But verse 14, that's Genesis chapter 15, that's Genesis 15, verse 13. But verse 14 says, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards, they should come out with great substance. What it looks like to me, I'm gonna be honest with you. It looks like it would be 400 years of affliction. They would afflict them for 400 years. All right, from the time that they was there into that 400 year signal, like what we saw in 2019. Also that nation whom they shall serve, in which they were afflicted by those people. He said, well, I judge. And afterward, they should come out with great substance. So, I, so it looks like the, the, the judgment takes place after the 2,000, the 400 years. So after 400 years of affliction, not that they would leave all of a sudden, but Yah will start judging that nation. Now we can see when he brought Israel out of Egypt, he sent Moses into Egypt. And from the time he began telling Pharaoh, let my people go and Pharaoh refused, Y'all start bringing plagues upon the land of Egypt. All right. And the last plague, they basically shoved them out of Egypt when that last plague hit, which would have to do with the Passover and the uh, death of the firstborn children in Egypt. All right. I think it's firstborn sons. And the, even the animals, the firstborn died. All right. So. Pharaoh and then pushed the who pushed the Israelites out of Egypt. When they realized they pushed and pushed their, their money bag out of there, they came after them. And that's when we see the Red Sea open. All those great mighty signs and wonders y'all did. All right. But it, this one is we got the same situation sort of going on. But it looks like Yah is doing something a little different here. All right. We get into that in a little bit, but in the meanwhile, but it looks like 400 years of affliction. After that 400 years, not that they won't be afflicted any longer after the 400 years. After the 400 years, Yahweh began to judge. All right, Yahweh started judging the nation that they served, who they was in service to. Um, basically, their iniquity had an end after that 400 years. So it looks like, to be honest with you, that the problem that got Israel into slavery is over with. And God started to judge these nations that took them into captivity. And the thing about this is that these nations don't realize that the time is over, their, their, their iniquity is, is not being judged anymore by captivity, all right? The nations don't realize that, but they, they've continued on with business as usual, as we see this Alabama brawl look like something that back in the time, back in the day, 
might have ended in that black guy's death. All right. No matter how many people were around, they might have ended in a situation that was unjust. You know, Trayvon Martin, uh, Castillo, what's his name, Fernando Castillo situation. Uh, looked like it might have ended in something like that. But to show you that something's different is that not only are Black folks and Negroes and people of color rejoicing about what happened, we see even the white folks rejoicing about it. They, I've seen many videos of white folks standing up clapping and saying it's one of the best videos they ever seen. YouTube got to be proud of it. All right, one of the top 10 videos of that brawl, including the guy hitting people upside the head with the chair. And he had to have been wrestling then. But, uh, but it was real. All right, it was real. And, uh, and I got to thinking about this, that we just saw something that we haven't seen before. We haven't seen a, in, in a, a justice situation taken over by the same folks that used to be afflicted. We, this is the first video, first thing we've ever seen like that. You know, where people got their just due right on, right on, right off the bat. They didn't have to go to court. They get it? Now the court is in session about the situation. I think the, the chairman of the board <laughs> called him, one with the chair, has got charges put on him. But we'll see what becomes of that. But justice was done right there. It didn't have to go to a court to get done. It was served right there on that, on that, on that dock, on that uh, Alabama dock, where those ships were coming in at. All right, justice was served. That's what we can see on this picture. We see three. It's interesting the number that we see with the hands with, that's been apprehended. Three of these uh, oppressors, and I, and I can imagine that these same folks might be related or descended from the from people of Alabama that basically had a you know that enjoyed the slave culture all the way up into the 1800s. You know the you know the 18 what is it 1865. They probably descendants from the same folks that really enjoyed that culture back then, Jim Crow culture and all of that. Because you can tell by the way they, they, that they took it to the uh, the man that was trying to get the, the the boat loaded on the dock was trying to get them to move their boat, a black man, a Negro man. The way they took it to him, they they took it, it was racial. You can tell it was racial. Now they might have been drunk. They might have had some some drinks or some smoke on them or in them and done what they did. But in the end, it was racial, you know, because it was nothing but, but pale skin on top of a, a Negro until the, until the, to the reinforcements came in on them, all right? To others of, the, of, that, of, that, of that man's uh, liking, uh, racial group who jumped in to defend it. All right, and it, just think of it. If it looks like a duck, talks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. It's a racial situation. Right? Why did they jump the man? If he was like them, would if he had pale skin, would they have jumped him? All right, would they have done that to him? If he, you know, if he had, or would they have moved their boat real quick if he was a man of their race? I think if, I, I'll be honest with you, I think if he was a man of their race, they would have respected him and moved the boat over. So that the other ship can can dock and unload their people, but because they didn't like him from the very beginning, they gave him trouble, and then they basically violently went at him. And that's when that hat got thrown in the air. <laughs> you know, you heard the term "I'm throwing my hat into the ring." He threw the hat into the ring, and now it was on like a chicken bone. All right, but right here it says, "Also that nation whom they shall serve." All right, the nation whom they should serve. And it doesn't say anything about affliction because it looks like this thing about affliction is over with. It don't mean that they're not afflicting the people. All right. But Yah is like Yah gave him 400 years for that affliction to afflict his people without judgment. Now, the nation whom they shall serve, and now they're still serving them, but Yah is done with the affliction. He's done with the punishment of his people 
for disobeying his commandments and his laws. The reason why they were brought over here, all right? The reason why they were brought over to the Americas and all the other places of the world as slaves is because of their rebellion against Yah's commandments, his word, his laws, his Torah, all right? They, these people had disobeyed and offended God some type of way to be treated like that. And they're not just all, just different types of Africans from all over the place. These are one type of Africans, all right? They're one type of Africans. You do most of these Africans, these people from Africa and from Spain and Portugal, you do most of their blood tests, it's a similar blood type. When you do everybody's blood test in Africa, it's not the same. And these people were the same type of people. Some might've been darker, some might've been lighter, but they're the same ethnic group. They were bought over all over the world as slaves, all right? But obviously they offended God, but God gave these people that, that, that he put into their hands, that he put, in, put them into their hands, the people whose hand they were put in, he gave them 400 years of affliction to afflict them. You know, no surety that thy seed should be a stranger in the land that is not theirs and shall serve them. And whose, whose seed is this? This Abraham's seed. He called it this time, he was called Abraham. This is before he changed his name to Abraham. This is Abraham or Abra Abraham's seed. They're his descendants. All right, would be basically in a place uh, that was not their land. It's not theirs. And it's not, it couldn't have been Egypt, even though that was Abraham's seed that was in Egypt too. But it was not, that was not the fulfillment of that prophecy. Because in Egypt, they were only there for 215 years and, and it was only somewhere around 100 years of affliction. You do a study on that and count those, count those years. Because even Joseph was still, uh, what is it, second man in command for so many years while Israel had gotten there and was resting, was living in the Atlantic Ocean. So they was not afflicted then. Remember that as a king that rose up in Egypt that knew not Joseph. After, after Joseph had died and been gone for about 65 years. And that was even a time, that was a, quite a while, and, you know, that a king, it took a king to rise up that remembered not Joseph, all right? And you count those years, you do a good count of it, it's around 100 years of affliction. But they were there for about 215 years altogether, all right? So that 400 years, that prophecy was not fulfilled in Egypt because they were not in Egypt for 400 years, all right? Now, they were, you know, when Abraham came to Canaan land and Yah made the covenant with him, from the time he made the covenant with him when he got to Canaan land to the time they came out of Egypt, it was 430 years. So they were in, they were in Canaan for 215 years and in, and in Egypt for 215 years, which makes 430. So that matches up with Paul was talking about in Galatians chapter three, that it matches up from the time God made the covenant, Yah made the covenant with Abraham to the time that he made the law with them on Mount Sinai it was 430 years, all right? So they couldn't have been in Egypt for 400 years. So this prophecy, fulfillment of this prophecy had to be fulfilled in a place like America, you know, where they was in this country for 400 years. And the reason why I think he's focused on, because they, they was enslaved in other lands too. The reason why I think he's focusing on America is because of the house of David. Like I mentioned last week, it, it looks like this is the house of David in America. Just like in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar took the house of David in the captivity, but Daniel and the three Hebrew boys and all of them, and then you can see he was even focused still on the house of David when they got released because Zerubbabel was a descendant, direct descendant, and heir to the throne of the Dav of the Davidic dynasty. But they, but he was not, he was not sitting anybody on David's throne after that. But Zerubbabel was a direct descendant, so his eyes are still on guess who, on David, David and his seed. So he's, his eyes is on Abraham and his seed, and his eyes is also on David. He made some promises to David. All right, he made some serious promises. So that's the reason why you can see it in Egypt, I mean, excuse me, in Babylon. When you come out of there, Zerubbabel was the leader. And Zerubbabel, and as well as Joshua, the high priest. Joshua was not a, a descendant of David, he was a descendant of Aaron. But you know, you can see the, 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 kingly, the kingly line and the priestly line was still in Yah's major theme of working. 
character and his center, center of focus, the kingly line, the priestly line. That's what he's mostly focused on. All right. You can what, what's going on right now in this Babylon that we live in today. The kingly line and the and the and the, the Levitical line is still in his focus. It's in his focus. And I and you, as you can see, you do a study on the Jews that were in Spain and Portugal. All right. Do a study on those Jews back in 1400s that that they was having troubles with and that they was kicking out of the land, out of Spain. And Christopher Columbus came over to America to find a place for the Jews to live. You know, I heard all of those stories. When I did a study on it, my own self, it's a whole different ball game. Where did those Jews go that were getting kicked out of Spain and Portugal? Well, which Jews were they? Because it's like you hear the story of they getting kicked out of Spain and Portugal. You don't hear the story after, where, where did they go, whatever it became of those Jews. Well, we know if you do a study on it, those Jews, those Jews were black Jews, Negroes, all right? And they were being kicked out of Spain and Portugal because they would not, they would not uh, convert to the Catholic religion. They would not get baptized and become a part of the Catholic faith. And you do a real accurate study of that, all right? They kicked the, they were kicking these these children out that they was first of all they didn't kick they didn't do anything to the to the grown up adults. The punishment was that if they wouldn't convert, their children would be sold as slaves, would be taken from them. And that happened. And many of them didn't convert. Some of them did, but many of them didn't. So the children were taken away. What did they take the children to? They started taking them to to Africa. You know, which is not too far away, the west coast of Africa. And then eventually they started taking them to the Americas. These these children that they were taken were not grown up adults. Most of them were very young. And there was only every now and then a few that was around 30. So the first Africans that were taken, the first black folks, Negroes that were taken in slave ships were, were children. After a while, they just started taking, no matter how old they were, they just started taking them. It was profitable and all of that, and they just took them. And including the ones that were in Spain and Portugal, whose children had already been taken away, they took those adults away too, all right? Even the ones that converted to Catholicism, they said, oh, no, we'll, we'll, we'll convert. You know, did the sign of the cross and everything and, and converted all the way to Catholicism. They took them as slaves, so it didn't matter any longer, all right? But those ones in Spain and Portugal were, if you go back in history, you study this, they had been in Spain and Portugal from the time of the Babylonian captivity. They, it's not that they just got there after 70, years 70 AD. They were not a part of that group that went into Africa and migrated over to the west coast of Africa over, over a thousand year period. They were already in Spain and Portugal after the Bab you know, from the time of the Babylonian captivity. What is that, 600 AD? And who were these Jews, these black Jews that were in Spain and Portugal from the time of 600 AD, I mean, excuse me, BC. 600 BC is when they were taken, when the Babylonian captivity took place. So these Jews were, 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 were migrated, they migrated to Spain and Portugal to escape the Babylonian captivity, Nebuchadnezzar. They had been there since 600 BC, all right? 600 BC, so who were these people? They were the house of David, that it took off and left and went the other direction. The house of David, they were descendants of King David. So when they when the when the Pope had trouble with these with these with these Jews, these black, really Negro Jews that were in Spain and Portugal, he was having trouble with the house of David, with David and his seed. Because they would not convert to Catholicism. Okay. And they were the last ones that were bought over because they held out because they went on and gave the children away. And then they even started converting to Catholicism, even though I don't think they really converted for, because um, they really believed it. They converted basically to stay, to, to not be victim to slavery, to the slave trade. In the end, they got, they got taken anyway, all right? But that's the house of David. And they were mostly bought over to, guess what? America. And they were the last ones bought over. I think uh, they bought them over in the 1600s. But most of the earlier slaves, including the children of those people that were bought over, 
last were bought over earlier, like in the 1500s. You know, slave trade began in, in the 1500s, early 1500s. All right, early 1500s, the last one they were bought, guess what? They bought the adults from the House of David in Spain and Portugal, even though they had converted to Christianity. They bought them over anyway. 1619, Jamestown, Virginia. So that's who these people were. And so if you African-American or Negro in this country called America, guess what? There's a chance, as a high likelihood that you are descended from King David. That you are the royal house of Israel, the royal house of Judah, from the great king himself, the king of, that's what is the second king of Israel. There's a great chance of that. Now we do have others, Negroes from, uh, from Levi, Benjamin, yes, running around here in America, but they're not the major folks. And that, that's not the major people that's really here. The major people that's here is the house of David. All right. Well, you can see history repeating itself in a whole big giant way. And we see Egypt right here in America. He said after 400 years, after the also, all that nation whom they shall serve after the 400 years of affliction, he will judge. That's Genesis 15, 13, and 14. He will judge. So what's going on right now? What's going on right now is judgment. Judgment. So what you can expect to see is that people, as you can see, let me show you, let me show you real quick. As you can see, the look on this guy's face right here. Let me get my clues over here. Look on his face is like, what happened? We usually got away with stuff like that. All right. <laughs> we usually got away with stuff like this. What, what, what's going on? Well, remember that 2019 year period, which was 400 years. All right. We, we were expecting that we would some type of way miraculously be delivered. But he said that they would afflict him for 400 years, all side of the nation and they should serve when I judge. When will he judge? He would judge after the 400 years. All right. Yah, the, the, what's his name? El Shaddai, I'd say what he revealed his name to Abraham. Hold on, let me see real quick, just a moment. After these things, is, is uh, Genesis 15. After these things, the word of Yahweh came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield and thy, thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Adonai Yahweh. His, his was really something. Whenever the name Adonai Yahweh is used, Adonai Yahweh, that, that word Yahweh, it almost sounds like Yahweh, but it's Yahweh. Whenever it's used, it has something to do with Yahweh becoming. That means he's going to become in this situation. What, the, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that when Yahweh becomes what he's going to become for Israel in the latter days, Israel is going to be delivered. When we see Moses um, trying to deliver Israel, leading and following Yah's command to, to lead them out of Egypt, Moses is really walking in Yahweh's shoes. It's Adonai Yahweh. All right. He's walking in Adonai's shoes. All right. And I just had it up here just a little bit ago. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go there later for anything. But um, that was a time when uh, the Israelites, not, well, I, let, me, let me leave it alone. I, I really would like to jump on that topic. Maybe I should. Maybe I should. Let me do it. Let me, let me give, give you a, a quick synopsis. That was a time when Israel, when they were hungry, all right? They were hungry. They remembered the, the watermelon, the leeks, the onions, and all of that from Egypt. And they told Moses, you brought us out here to starve. Give us some meat that we may eat and be full. And Moses was like, he went to Yahweh and said, who am I? I they had, you know, it, you expect me to, to carry these people like this, kill me out of hand. Because they, they're looking at me like as if I'm the one that's done this to them. 
All right. Eventually, Yah chose 70 elders and put some of Moses' spirit on them. All right. But the major thing is, is that they was, they was looking at this. They were looking at Moses like Moses was Yahweh. That's what Moses was trying to tell them. They're looking at me like as if I'm you, Yahweh. Really, in actuality, Moses was in the place of Yahweh. So what's going to happen in the latter days? In the latter days, what they're going to see, which we're going to see, is Yahweh. That's what we're going to see. Now, I'm going to be straight up with you. You know, when I, long, you know, a while back, you know, coming out of Christianity, I came out of the church. My father was in the church. So when I got born again in, in uh, what is that, 1981, I was getting born again from, a, from the church, even though I was not really majorly a part of the church system, from the church uh, tradition. I got born again, literally. All right, so I know what being born again is all about. All right, there's a change that takes place in a person's heart, and they're never the same again. You can you can continue to do what you was doing beforehand. You can continue to walk in sin, but it's not going to match up. You're not going to you're not going to feel at home doing it once you're born again. 1984, I was filled with the Spirit, so I know what that's all about too, and I know the realness and the radicalness of what happened to the disciples in Acts chapter two. When they got filled with the spirit. I know that <laughs> I experienced that firsthand. All right. So it is it's a real thing. All right. But uh Yah is gonna come down here. Yah himself is gonna come down. What I see, I like I said, I used to think that Yah, that Yahweh Shai was Yahweh. And I, I love that doctrine so much that your house was your house. But I'm gonna tell you what happened to me. Yah allowed me to believe that all the way up until recently, up until these times we're living in today. That was way from way back in 1981, 84. You know, I'm preaching doctrine that your house is really your But it took your house to, to come basically like he took a he took a little trip, a little decent trip. And I know it was in the spirit. He was not literally here physically. But it's like his spirit was. And he told me, and I was sitting down right where I'm at right now, watching TV. And he told me, he said, I'm not Yah, I'm not Yahweh, I'm not God. It took him to do that for me to really put two and two together to say, okay. At the time he told me that, he opened up my understanding. I said, Oh, I get it. I get it. So what's gonna happen? Well, when we see in Daniel chapter seven, we see the ancient of days coming. He comes before the sun comes. Yahweh is coming back, no doubt. But before Yahweh gets back here, Yahweh is gonna be here. He's gonna be the ancient of days. And he's gonna be the one that takes out these nations. It's gonna be like, in, in, instead of Moses, it's gonna be like, instead of Moses, it's gonna be Yahweh. We see in Acts chapter 24, Acts chapter 24 after, Israel made the covenant with Yahweh when they came when they were on Mount Sinai. That he made a trip after the after the blood covenant after when they were eating the, the covenant confirming meal. Moses made Ab, Abihu, and the seven elders of Israel were eating on top of the mountain. And Yahweh came down and on, under his feet was a paywork of a sapphire stone. They saw God and they ate and drank. He even laid his hand on. Them. All right, that's what it says in Exodus twenty four. You can go there and I, maybe I, when I. In a little bit. Hold on just a moment. I have left this picture up there. Uh, let me see here. Let's go to Exodus 24. Hold on just a moment, crowd, people. Exodus 24, now they were on Mount Sinai when this happened. And uh, let's see here. So you can see that there's four things, I think there's four things that happened on the co covenant. There was a proposal and acceptance, proposal and acceptance of the proposal to be his people by Israel. That was a sacrificial victim or victims, the blood 
all right? And then after the blood sacrificial victim, then you have the covenant, the covenant confirming meal. That happens in marriage, in Hebrew marriage, all right? The man proposes, the woman accepts. Then they go into the wedding chamber. And when that time comes, they go into the wedding chamber. There's blood spilled on the sheets. So to the hymen, you know, and all of that. And then they come out of the bridal chamber and they have a they have a covenant confirming meal. All right. That's how it happened. That's how it happened here. All right. Exodus 24, 9, then went up Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abidu, and the 70 elders of Israel. They saw the God of Israel. Let me highlight that for you. I'll show you that this is not Yahweh. They saw. We saw God, the God, God himself. We saw the God of Israel. I'm trying to highlight this better. Hold on just a moment. I'm still doing all this with my left hand, everybody. I'm really right-handed. They saw the God of Israel. God of Israel is Jehovah. All right. And that was under his feet as they were a paved work of a sapphire stone as the body of heaven and its goodness. Upon the, nobles, uh, upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw God. Let me highlight that. Show you that it's not a God. Because in certain situations, you can see Yahabashai is a God, little g. Because what he revealed to me when he finally cut me short on saying that he was God, he made it clear. All right. They saw God and did eat and drink. All right. So what you, what what do we, what are we to expect? All right. Well, what we'd expect is that basically God is going to be Moses was in when he brought Israel out of Egypt. Moses was in the place of Yahweh, this God of Israel. In the latter days, when he does his work, in the latter days, you know, better is the end of it thing than the beginning. This is going to be the end of it. And guess who's going to be with us? How do we know he's going to be with us? Let me take you to another place real quick. This is what's going on. That's when you see the faces of them guys looking like, what then happened? They, they were expecting to come out of that victorious. All right? They were expecting to come out of that without any trouble. But it looked like if somebody opened up a can of, and I, I, I'm not a, my mother taught me not to say curse words and all of that, and just talk as best as I could. Not kept on with that with that uh, teaching, but somebody opened up a can of whip ass on them, all right? And they didn't understand it, it was shot, all right? Can of whip ass was opened up on them guys, all right? And it would normally, stuff like that normally wouldn't happen, all right? Why did that happen? Is it because that 400 years of affliction is over with? All right, let's see. Now, God, you see right there in Exodus 24, that God come down at the, at the covenant confirming the meal. And the covenant was confirmed between God, Yah, and Israel. He came down and showed himself. And we see a new thing happening, and I'm going to show you the scriptures on that in a second, too, of a new covenant, which hasn't happened yet. We get, we're in the New Testament scriptures. We have a New Testament, but there's no new covenant yet, or a renewed covenant is what you might want to call that. All right. All right. Let's see. Therefore, Revelation seven fifteen. Therefore, are they before? And I'm going to show you the scripture right before that. And I said unto him, Sir, because he asked, he said, he said, one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are read in white robes? And whence came they? Remember that you know this verse nine starts off with. Uh, I beheld a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues stand before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. So that the Lamb is not on the throne, that he's, he's, with, he's on the right hand of God, shows you that the Lamb, which we know is Yahweh Shahamashiach, this Lamb right here, is not God. 
the one that sits on the throne is God right here, this throne. Let's see, let me highlight that real quick. They stood before the throne and before the lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. So it looks like when you do that type of thing with the palm in your hand, that looks like the, the Feast of, of Tabernacles. You do that on the Feast of Tabernacles. So they celebrate Tabernacles. What is Tabernacles representing? God, Yah, tabernacling with man. All right, that's the reason why it's called Tabernacle. He's, he's gonna tabernacle. Now in the beginning, you know, Yah had not tabernacle with him because they sinned against him. So he tabernacled in the wilderness for, for what is that, 40, 38, 40 years? And they cry with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God, sit on the throne and unto the Lamb. Now you have to think about this. What does God need salvation for? And the Lamb, but what is, what's this thing about salvation? To our God and to the sit upon the throne and to the Lamb. Okay, let me move on. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell upon the throne, fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, amen, blessing, glory, wisdom, and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever, amen. And one of the elders answered and said unto me, what are these which are, which are written in white robes? Once came they, he said unto them, sir, thou knowest, and he said unto me, these are they which come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes, make them white in the blood of the lamb. All right, now watch this. Therefore are they before the throne of God day and night, day, 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 hold on. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Hallelujah. See that? This is Revelation chapter seven. So he that sit upon the throne, what is he gonna do? Is he gonna be still up in heaven? Or is he gonna be on, is he gonna be in heaven and in earth at the same time? It looks like he's gonna be in heaven. He's like, he says, heavens is his throne, earth is his footstool. Heavens is the Lord's throne, is Jehovah's throne, and earth is his footstool. So it says, he that sit upon the throne shall dwell among them. This is not going on up in heaven. They're not, this is not happening up in heaven. This is on the earth. All right. Yeah, I didn't mean, yeah, I didn't create man to dwell up in heaven. When he created the earth, he, he made him from the dust of the ground to dwell on this earth. The Lord is permanent. All right. So he's talking about some people from all nations, tongues, languages, and all of that, in white robes. And he says, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. That word dwell means, let's go take a look at it. So this is what's going on, y'all. You know, that this time is drawing close, it's drawing near. The 400 years of affliction are done. 400 years of affliction are done. So what happens if these people afflict, continue to afflict? Then they're gonna have some repercussions from Yahweh. That word dwell, there's skenu. Let me see if I can highlight it real quick, skenu. To tent or encamp, that is figuratively to occupy as a mansion. I mean, how much I said in my father's house of many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'd go to prepare a place for you, right? So these mansions that he was talking about preparing, talking about earthly bodies, tabernacles, like Second Corinthians chapter five speaks about tabernacles. If I, if the, if our body of this tent would dissolve, we have tabernacles in heaven. All right. And I think it says tabernacles right there in First, Second Corinthians chapter five. He also said in John chapter 14, I think it is, uh, in my father's house of many mansions, it says to occupy as a mansion, but specifically to reside as God did in the tabernacle of old, a symbol to, of, to, for, for protection, dominion, to dwell. See, God dwelt in the tabernacle. Yes, God did, when they came out of Egypt in the wilderness, dwell in a tabernacle, but he didn't tabernacle like he wanted to among them because they had broke the covenant, all right? So he made, made Moses build a tabernacle, Ark of Covenant and all of that, so he could dwell. But how does Yah really want to tabernacle with his people? He wants to physically tabernacle. That's the reason why we see, right here it says, he that sitteth on the throne, shall tabernacle or dwell among them, all right? Highlight it again one more time. 
They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun's light on them, nor any heat. For the land which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them to live in fountains of waters. And God, the one that's dwelling among them, the God that dwells among them, shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Let me, let me pull that up a little bit. So wipe away all tears from their eyes. All right. So, so that's what's coming. And most people, you know, like I said, that's a hard doctrine. Who is Yahweh Shai? And who's coming? That's a hard one. That was a hard one for me for years. All right. And even the most savvy Bible scholars would tell you that they, you just you just Google it. You ask them who is Jesus Christ, they say he's God. But in actuality, you go throughout the scriptures, you accurately go throughout the scriptures in a very uh, savvy way, in the, in the way it should be gone through. You find out your house has not God. All right. So who is he? What is he? He is the lamb. The lamb of what? The lamb of God. All right. The lamb of God. He basically was the lamb that, that was to give his life for the sins of the whole world. So the Lamb of God gave his life for the sins of, of Israel, all right? In order for the, for the Gentile nations to survive and be in the millennium and be into an everlasting life, also that blood would have to be applied to them. Now, I don't want to get into that topic right now, but we know that he's setting up Israel, like he said in the beginning in Deuteronomy 28. He's going to set them high above all nations of the earth as the sky, as a, as the sky is above the earth. It's because it'll set them way above the nations. All right. So that means if there are other people of other nations that's going to live forever with them, that blood has to be applied to their lives too. All right. Or either, either that blood has to be applied or they have to eat from the tree of life or both. Because it does speak about the leaves are for the healing of the nations. The leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations or both, where the blood has to be applied to them and they have to eat from the tree or the leaves, at least the tree, the leaves of the tree have to be applied to them so they could be healed. All right, but we won't get into that right now. But what we know is this, that this guy right here, basically his, his look and his glance is telling a whole lot, <laughs> it's saying a whole lot. Right here. All right. It's looking like he's looking at that other guy. Man, what the hell just happened? You mean they're going to arrest us? We're white. We, we've gotten away with this stuff for hundreds of years. What the hell is going on? Is it because the police officers are mostly black or people of color? We got to do something about that. What's going on here? All right. Like we said, just see it. That whenever you see that name Adonai Yahweh, which is it's, a, it's Lord, but it's little, it's capital L, little O, little R, little D, with with all caps on God. All right. Now all of that has something to do with Baal, Baal, and all of that stuff. They put that in the Bible. But overlooking that, we already know that that's Adonai, and that capital that God is all caps is Yahweh. Whenever you see the name Yahweh, that, that takes you all the way back to when, when Yah spoke to Moses from the burning bush. All right, takes you all the way back there. Spoke to Moses from the burning bush as an angel. The angel appeared in the burning bush and spoke to him and told him that he, he said, I am that I am. That word, I, that word I am, a higher, higher means to become. So what's going on? Well, well when Yah starts to become, he starts to draw close to the world, to the coming. These things, you see things like this going on. That the nations that afflicted Yah's people, let me go back there to that scripture. The nations that afflicted Yah's people, all right, let me go back here, hold on just a moment. Let's go, what is that, Genesis 15? The nations that afflicted Yah's people won't be getting that victory any longer over his people. All right, they won't be being victorious any longer. That's what's going on. So 
when you look at this and you say, hey, we just seen some stuff we've never seen before. Right, let me go back to being the last book of the Bible. We've seen some stuff we've never seen before. Normally, these people are oppressors come out victorious and they get away with whatever the foul stuff that they did. But what's going on now? These people, everybody's rejoicing about this victory that just happened at the Alabama brawl. Okay. Let's take a look at this, just 15. Whenever you see, in a lot of uh, Exodus, uh, Ezekiel has this term for Yahweh. It's called Adonai. As you can see that, that L right there. Let me, let me highlight it first. Adonai. Yahweh. Let's look at the words. Hebrew 136 for Adonai. Let's see. Adonai right there. So a lot of people would pronounce it Adonai, but I, when I look at it from other positions, it's really Adonai. And Paleo Hebrew, there's a there's a regular A in there. Adonai, Adonai, you know, and there's an I sound, an I in. But in modern day Hebrew, you they might say it just like they got it pronounced right here, Adonai. And really, you don't call anything other than Yahweh this name right here, uh, Adonai. Emphatic form of 113, Hebrews 113, which is Adon. It means the Lord, used as a proper name of God only. See that? So you don't call Yahweh Shai Adonai. All right? Yahweh Shai is not called Adonai in the scripture. Only God. God only. And what it means, the proper way of saying it in Hebrew, what it would mean is my Lord. My Lord. I like that. All right. So whenever you see that, that's Yahweh. But check this out. Because there's all caps for God. Hebrew 3069, Hebrew 3068 is Yahweh. Let's see what this one says. Yahweh. Can you highlight that? So the A right there in the Paleo Hebrew, that they got that E for it. Yahweh. All right. Yahweh. Whenever you see it like that, it's reminiscing of when Yah came down on the burning bush with that angel and spoke to Moses and told him that he is who he is. He will be what he will be. So whenever you see it's talking Adonai Yahweh, it's always talking about Yahweh coming down in salvation for his people. That means being, you know, coming down. Hold on just a moment. Whenever you see it like this, it has something to do with Yahweh coming down to deliver his people. All right. So that Yahweh has something to do with that word higher. All right. Haya, Asher, Ahaya. Some people still think that it, Yahweh's name is Ahaya, Ahaya. But basically, he was telling you what he would do. You know, I am that I am. In other words, I will be what I will be. But my name is Yahweh, and this is my memorial for all generations, he said later on. All right? So that name, Ahaya, and this word right here, Yahweh, is related. Okay? So we see that name being used is gonna have something to do with Yahweh coming down to deliver his people in a lot of days. How you know? Because right here, Abraham is sacrificing what he's got a heifer, three years old, a goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took, he took unto him all these three and these and that divided them in the midst and laid each against each piece against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and no one horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, No, but surely thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and shall afflict them four hundred years. You know, when you really study when Yah was talking about Abraham, all the land is going to give him in the latter days, because it didn't happen yet. The part of that land of Egypt, 
including Goshen, was really part of Abraham's uh, promise and inheritance. So Israel dwelt basically in the land of Goshen in Egypt, which is really a part of the inheritance that God had already promised, that I, he had already promised Abraham, the Goshen area. All right. Part of that land of Egypt is really Abraham. The land, the part where they stayed at in Goshen is really that part of that, that inheritance. All right, and he said to Abraham, know of a surety that thy seed should be a stranger, stranger in the land that is not theirs and shall serve them. So that couldn't have been Egypt because a certain part of Egypt was really theirs. And the land of Goshen, when he stayed at that 215 years was theirs. And they should serve them and afflict them 400 years. All right. And uh, that word afflict, let's check it out. Check it out, see if it has something to do with the way that guy, them guys are looking. All right. Sixty thirty one in the Hebrew. Primitive root, possibly rather identical with Hebrew sixty thirty, through the idea of looking down or browbeating. Let me highlight that. So they would be looked down upon and browbeaten for 400 years. Looking down or browbeaten. When you get browbeaten, that means people are looking at you crazy. Like as if you ain't got nothing on them, you're looking down on you. There's nothing you can do about it. You're looking down. And that's the way this, these people, these Negroes have been treated for 400 years. All right? They will be afflicted like that for 400 years. There'd be nothing they can do about it. All right? Afflict, they will afflict them. They shall afflict them for 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. When will he judge them? after the 400 years. So they would still be in the land of their affliction, but Yah would judge them just like he did in Egypt when Israel was still in the land of Egypt, Yah judged Egypt, okay? Afterwards, shall they come out with great suffering? So basically, this is telling us we're gonna get reparations. Just like Israel got the reparations from the Egyptians, of all of that stuff that they borrowed from them, they, they broke Egypt when they came out of Egypt. They broke them because they borrowed all types of stuff and they were willing to give everything they had to them to get up out of here. I just had to bury my firstborn son. They gave him clothes, all types of stuff. So they broke them. They basically had to pay them for that. And probably didn't pay them all, but they had to pay them for that, for the, for that slavery, that 100 years of slavery. Remember, they were enslaved for that whole 20, 15 years they were there. All right. When Joseph was still the second in command. All right. So they, we're going to come out. We're going to come out of here with reparations. Now, here's the point to this reparations that probably is going to happen. Let me highlight that great substance. Because this reparation that Israel is going to get is going to be more than just money. Even though it's going to be a lot of substance, it's going to be a lot of riches. But the reparations they're going to get is going to be more than just riches. They're going to also get slaves. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and this is Isaiah 14. And will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land, and the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of Yahweh for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. So not only are they gonna get the same people that they serve, because it's saying right here, the same folks that they serve, right? Let's see, they shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of Yahweh for servants and handmaids. They shall take them, they shall take them captives, whose captives they were. So it's not, Yah has a way of doing things exactly like he said. I don't think the innocent folks that didn't have slaves is gonna be these people. 
It's going to be the same folks, the descendants of the same folks that had Israel in this country as slaves and done all types of atrocities to them. It's going to be those same people who they're going to take, they're going to rule over their oppressors. They're going to take them as captives. They should take them captives whose captives they were and they should rule over their oppressors. Mm -hmm. The very same people. So when you see that picture up there, the, that guy looking at the other fellow, like, what happened? They got the handcuffs on and everything. These guys coming at the center of the slave trade. And then really Alabama, where that brawl took place at, and that dock is where they did the slave trade in that. Right there on that dock. All right. Let's go back here. So you can see what Yah is doing. He's setting this thing up, and no, they that affliction. That time they gave, the time they gave them to afflict Israel, and four hundred years is over with. Now we're still serving, we're still serving these people. All right, we still are. Let me go. Let me scroll back up. And he said, and also the nation whom they shall serve. Let me highlight this. But I mean, the nation that they're serving when this thing starts to happen, after that 400 years of affliction, that, that, that anniversary, that time period has come to pass, that nation whom they shall serve, will I judge. And afterward, they shall come out with great substance. So we're in the judgment time. We're in the time of judgment. All right. Now, do I, do I, when I'm trying to take Negroes, go out there and, and, and bop white folks and do whatever you want to do? No, because Yah is going to judge you for that too. All right? You don't want to do that. All right? You don't want to do that. Because even when Israel came out of Egypt, excuse me, even when Israel came out of Egypt, if you didn't do things right, you would get your butt beat. And that's what happened when uh, Aiken, a guy named Aiken, took took stuff from uh, took stuff from Jericho that the uh, stuff that was consecrated to Yahweh, the forbidden uh, booty. He was not to take anything out of Jericho to leave it alone. He took some and hid it in his tent. And when Israel went out there to fight a little little piece of ground of Canaan land. Those little Canaanites chased them all the way back to where they was at. And some people died. And Joshua and them fell down before Yahweh, basically saying, what happened? Why did we just get that bus beat like that? And Yahweh told him, why are you about falling down before me? Did you take anything I, which I told you not to take? The, the forbidden stuff from the land of Jericho? And they did a test. They found out. They found out it was Achan. They took some stuff and hid it in his tent. And they stoned him and rose up a great heap of stones over him, too, and his whole family. All right, so you, if you go out there and you fight when Yah has not sent you in this war, you're going to get the same thing. You it might not turn out like you want it to turn out. But just know that Yah is judging. And sit back and watch. Sit back and watch and see what happens. He's judging. And things are not turning out the same way it used to turn out when these people are afflicted, when they afflicted us. All right. All the way up until the end, all the way up until the end. All the way up until this end, we've had some serious killings. You know, like I just said a little bit ago, Trayvon, uh, Philando. Uh, it was on videotape, on camera, on telephone, all right? So you got to let Yah do it. And you sit back and you hold your peace, like you said, at the, at the, at the Red Sea. You're going to see, you're gonna see the, the salvation of God. You're going to hold your peace, all right? And, uh, and is Yah going to use his people to... to to thump the nation, yes, he will. Yes, he will. Let's check, let's check this out.
He's going to use Israel like a battle axe. Like you don't want to go out there and just use your own self and just say, okay, God's going to use me like a battle axe. Let me do my thing. No, you don't want to do that. When it's time, he'll let you know. Let's see here. Hold on just a moment. Hold on just a moment. Jeremiah 50, 51. Let's go there real quick. Jeremiah 51, let's see. The major scripture there is verse 20. Die my battle acts, Jeremiah 51, verse 20, and weapons of war. Let me highlight it. For in with thee I will break in pieces the nations, and with thee I will destroy kingdoms. And highlight that. And with thee I will break in pieces the horse and his rider, and with thee I will break in pieces the chariot with his rider. With thee I will also break in pieces man and woman, and with thee I will break in pieces old and young, and with thee I will break in pieces young man and the maid. And I will break in pieces with thee the shepherd and his flock. With thee I will break in pieces the husbandman and his yoke of oxen. With thee I will break in pieces captains and rulers. And I will, rend, rend, I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea and all their evil that they have done in Zion in their sight. Let me read that again. And I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of the Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in their sight. See if you howl. All right. So, yeah, he's going to use Israel to get back. So, you know, he, they're going to be his battle axe, like he just said right there. Thou my battle axe, weapons of war. All right. So, do you just go out there on your own and do it? No. Just wait around. Just, you'll see it. Just like the thing that just happened in, in the Battle of Alabama, a brawl. When it's time for that, you'll know it. All right, no, you just don't go out there and check it up on your own stupid mind, your stupid intellect, and do it your own damn self. You know what I'm saying? I hate, I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't like stupid people. I don't like people that's unwise. You know, I don't wanna be like that, and I don't like people like that. All right, because they're gonna get their judgment for being stupid and unwise. All right, let's go here to Jeremiah, another place in Jeremiah. Jeremiah speaks about this time. This is going to basically, it's going to end in the great tribulation. That's what we got coming. The great tribulation is going to be really for Israel's sake. To deliver Israel, the great tribulation, basically most of that tribulation and the great tribulation is going, is going to be against the nations. And also Israelites that are connected and hooked on to the nations. So if Yah is coming to judge the nations and you're, you're sitting there and you're riding right along with the nations, riding on their horse, riding with them, on their team, you're going to get it too. Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It's even as the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Let me highlight that. The day is great, so that none is like it. It's even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Let me highlight that. So who's going to be saved out of it? Jacob. And whenever you see Jacob, when y'all talking about Jacob, that means he's still not at home. You know, when we see Jacob's name, when he was dealing with his uncle Lebanon, and uh, what name was that? Lebanon? Lebanon? Uh, I forgot the name of that place uh, he was living in where his uncle lived at. Adanaram. All right. He was still there serving his uncle Lebanon, which means white, or somebody that turned white. His name was Jacob. His name didn't become Israel until he was on his way back, back to the land of Canaan land where his, where his father and mother were. 
whenever you see the name Jacob, that means Israel is still in the process of returning. They're still in the land of their captivity. All right. For it shall come to pass in that day, said Yahweh of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, I will, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of, of him. So that's what's going on. That's what we're looking at right now. All right. So there's anointing after that 400 years of, of affliction. There's an anointing to have these, these yokes of bondage broken off of Israel, even though they still serve him, Laban, some, you know, symbolically serving Laban, which means white. God's anointing on these people is to burst them, burst them bonds off of his neck, off of him. So these people are still going to be, what, is, what are they going to still be doing? They're going to still be trying to shackle with bonds on Jacob, put the shackles on him. Or the, why they putting the shackles still on Jacob while he, he's still serving them. Shackles on the mind and whatever, because most of the shackles are broken off, our, off of our bodies. The shackles is on the mind, on the spirit. He's going to bust those bonds. And strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve you. How are they Allah high? Let me highlight that. And you see the Hebrew Israelites on the street corners teaching and preaching. Now, I don't believe in everything that they say. But you get a full logist of it, who they are. But they shall serve you, Howard the Alahim, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. All right. Therefore, fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith Yahweh. Neither be dismayed, or ye be dismayed, O Israel. For I will save thee from afar, and I see from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest and quiet, and then shall make him afraid. But what you're seeing right now with this Alabama brawl, that basically this anointing that's on Jacob to, to have his bonds broken, not only on his body, because you don't see any shackles on the body. It's in the mind, it's, it's up here in the mind, it's in the heart, which a lot of people say the mind is the heart, the same thing. But I, what I think of the heart is the spirit. The mind and the spirit is two different things. For I am with thee, saith Yahweh, to save thee, though I make a fool end of all nations, where I, have scattered, where I have scattered thee, yet would I not make a fool in a bee, but I will correct thee in measure when I leave thee altogether unpunished. All right. Verse 15, why criest thou for thy affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable, for thy multitude of thine iniquity. For thy sins were increased, I have done these things unto thee. Therefore, all, that, all they that devour thee shall be devoured. And all thine adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity, and they shall, and they shall spoil thee. And they that spoil thee shall be a spoil. And all they that prey upon thee shall be what I give for a prey. And I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith Yahweh. Because they call thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. Therefore, therefore thus, thus saith Yahweh. Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places and the city shall be built upon her own heat and the palace shall remain after the manner thereof. And out of them shall proceed thanksgiving and the voice of them that make merry. And I will multiply them and they shall not be few. I will also glorify them and they shall not be small. Their children shall also be as a time and their congregation shall be established before me and I will punish all that oppress them. See that? I will punish all that oppress them. So what you're seeing right now with the Alabama brawl is the beginning of this. All right. What you're seeing, what beginning of what? Of God punishing all that oppress us. Because remember the affliction time is over. Remember it was 400 years of affliction. After that 400 years comes in in 2019, there's an anointing on these people to bust out of that affliction. Where when these people afflict us, Yah basically is doing something also to them. It's no longer just a one-way street, it's two ways. And in the end, it's gonna be a one-way street going back to Israel. It's two ways on this now. All right, so you're seeing this stuff starting to happen. Let me see. Let's go to a few other scriptures real quick. Micah. All 
at the thigh. And this is what we're seeing with this anointing on these people that have been afflicted. Now that affliction, Yah is no longer allowing the nations to afflict these people, but they, 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 they're still serving these people, but he's not allowing them to afflict them any longer. All right. Micah 5, 7, and the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as dew from, the, from Yahweh, that the showers upon the grass, that tears not for man, nor waited for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people, as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a lion among the flocks of sheep, who if he go through, both tread it down and tear it in pieces, and none can deliver. Thine hand shall be lifted upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. So it's going to get worse than what we saw with the Alabama ball. Why? Because the enemies of Yahweh's people, are going to, they're, not, they're not going to take that lying down. They're going to try some more. They're going to try some more stuff. And the more they try, the more the people are going to stand up. The more it's going to be like a lion. And what we saw there in the Alabama brawl was Judah jumping into action. Judah no longer is a coward. You know, he's not the cowardly, he's not the cowardly, uh, what is it called? A uh, lion on a uh, on a movie. What's that movie called? Uh, the Wizard of Oz. Judah's no longer like that. Judah's now jumping into action. He's now being like a real lion. All right. And when he's when he's an old lion, who should rouse him up? Genesis forty nine verse ten. All right. Who's gonna rouse him up? He's being roused up right now. All right. Thine hand shall be lifted, lifted up on lifted up on pawn thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. All right. So the remnant of Jacob is among the many people as a dew from, from your house. As the showers upon the grass, a tear of not for man, nor waited for the sons of men, Micah 5 7. So you can see what's going on. The remnant of Jacob should be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people, as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep. So that, that, that right there is telling you who Yahweh is coming mainly for. He's coming for that lion, the lion of Judah. And that's why I was just telling you about the people that was in Spain and Portugal that were Jews were really Negroes. If you do a lot of study on that, you'll find out they were Negroes. Many people thought Jews were only black. So they saw, they saw the ones in Europe, the Ashkenazi Jews, and say, hey, wait a minute, there's some, there's some pale-skinned folks that are saying that they're Jews. How could it be? But those Jews that were in Spain and Portugal had been there ever since the Babylonian captivity, 600 BC. And they were from the house of David. They were from the, the line, of, the seed of David. And these, these Jews that were in Spain and Portugal are the major ones that they brought to America, the United States of America. All right. So what do we see hop out all of a sudden, ready to fight? On the Alabama ball, we saw basically, we saw some of David's children, especially the young men that swam across the alligator infested waters to get over there into the brawl. 16 year old kid, which David was around 16 years old when he fought the giant. So you can see kind of how all of that's matching up. All right. But things are not turning out like they expect. Why? Because of the time that we're living in. What is the time we're living in? It's the time that Yah is about ready to deliver his people. This is the time he told Abraham about. It was not the Egyptian captivity that he was really talking about at, at earnest at most. He was talking about this captivity when he told him the 400 years of affliction. He was talking about where we at today. All right. Now, one day I was coming down, I was coming down some stairs good to go to work the place I was at. And I heard them talking going on between this older black man and a young man that was looking up to this older black man. I was so tired, I, I was not looking to see what was going on. But the, the conversation kind of sounded like Abraham was talking to somebody, but I still didn't look. 
When he saw me, he said, this one also is my brew right here too, but he just doesn't know it right now. This is years ago. This is like in the late 80s. He said, this is my brew right here also, but he doesn't know it right now. He was pointing at me. When I went and sat down, I thought on that and I said, wait a minute, was, did I just hear Abraham talking to somebody about how? Abraham way back thousands of years ago. So Abraham knew the time and God allowed him to see what was going to happen. All right. He said, this one might brew also, but he just don't know it right now. I'm going to be honest with you. At that time, I didn't know for sure that I was Hebrew. I had not studied that. But he said I was his brew, but just didn't know it at that moment. His Hebrew, I was his seed. But as you can see, something is going on. What's going on? The Holy Spirit is not with them in their affliction no more. Not with them in their affliction. And what I know, they rounded these guys up, including the chairman. And I think he's the only one of the, of the opposing side that got arrested. And then I think they charged him, with the, uh, from what I hear, they charged him with hitting with the chair. We'll see what becomes of it. But, uh, but it's time. It's time, 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 time. Now, what I would say to my people who have, whose ancestors have been in this country, been in this affliction, and you have been in this affliction, it's time to get your, yourself right with Yahweh, all of us. If there's some place where, we, where we're lacking in our relationship with Yahweh, we need to get it right. Because remember, there's two thirds of our people, there's one third that's gonna make it through the fire. Let me see if I can find it. Gonna make it through the fire and through the flame, but two thirds will be cut off. Let me see if I can find it real quick. So though Israel be like the sands of the sea, only a remnant will be saved. So what happens to the other people? They get cut off and they sit in the destruction. We just read though, though uh, the God is going to destroy. He did. He said though, I make a fool the end of all nations where I scattered them. Yet would I not make a fool in a veal? Is what it's Jeremiah thirty. For I will punish thee in measure, and I leave thee altogether unpunished. Let's go back here. Uh, I think that's in Isaiah. We said like two thirds or one third. Let me see. Hold on just a moment. So not all Israel is going to be get the kingdom. In other words, not all Israel is going to get the kingdom. Only one third is going to get the kingdom. Let's see. Hold on just a moment. So what you want? I would when I speak to people and the people I'm talking to, I speak to them as trying to get the kingdom. You don't want to get anything less than the kingdom. Right. You want to get the kingdom.
just a moment. Let me see if I can find this in here. So one third will, will he bring through the fire. Let me try it like that. I probably can put something right up on the scripture, just like that, bring through the fire, let's try that. So if you really want to come through, you really want the kingdom, it's going to take your desire to be right there. Don't take everybody's desire. You got to desire the kingdom because if the righteous scarcely to be saved, right? What should the ungodly and the sinner appear? Well, the Bible speaks about the righteous scarcely being saved. That right there is saying they don't barely make it themselves. Okay, there it is. Zechariah 13.9. And highlight this for me. Let me get on thirteen nine. Thirteen eight says, and it shall come to pass in all the land, said Yahweh, two thirds therein shall be cut off and die. But but the third, the reason why I, I said one third didn't make it in the, the search engine, it says, but the third should be left therein. So out of all the Israelites. There's going to be a, there's the sand of the sea, right? But only a remnant will be saved. What's the remnant? The remnant is going to be a third. It's come to pass that in all the lands of Yahweh, two thirds should barren, should be cut off and die, and die. But, yet, but the third should be left there. And I will bring the third part through the fire. And we'll refine them as silver is refined. We'll try them as gold is tried. They should call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people, and they shall say, Yahweh is my Allahim. Zechariah chapter 13. All right. So, this is not only just for the people in America, it's going to start right here because it's going to start with Judah, not just with the tribe of Judah, but with the house of Judah, which is the, the kingdom, which is Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. All right. Hold on just a moment. So when God starts delivering Israel, it's going to be he's going to start with Judah, the kingdom of Judah, and then he's going to go to the kingdom of Israel, or Ephraim, or Joseph. Let's see. Let me see. And here he is right here. For behold, in those days, and at that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage is Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. They have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. So that right there is telling you that these people that they've done this to was Judah. What happened here in America? Around that time, 400 years ago, starting around that time, just what we were just talking about right here in the scriptures. They have cast lots for my people, given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. All right. But in those days, when he's talking about the time we live in right now, in those days and at that time when I, when I will bring in the captivity of Judah and Israel, then that's when he's going to basically anoint his people to have, the, have those jokes that were put on them, on their minds and their heart, broken. He's going to also be revealed. Yah is going to be revealed among his people. The same God that we saw in uh, Exodus chapter 24 that came down with a sapphire stone up under his feet, he's going to be revealed among his people. All right? And he said he's going he's gonna to gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. This is why I say that most people you know, that's talking about Jesus, Yahweh, is going to do this. Don't know what they don't know what they're studying. 
Yahweh saying he's going to do it? Well, they thinking that Yahweh's going to going to send Yahweh Shai to do it. I don't think so. I don't think he's going to send Yahweh Shai to do this. It's just going to be his own thing. All right, it's going to be his own thing. He's going to do. Like we just saw that the one that sits on the throne will dwell among them, right? In Revelation chapter seven. Right? This is going to be his own little thing that he's going to do. All right, and we can see it right here in Daniel chapter seven. After the four beasts have reigned over there for so many years, the end of it is guess who? Guess what? The ancient of the day, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, not Yahweh's throne, but the thrones of these nations were cast down. And the ancient of the days did sit, his garment was white as snow. The hair of his head like pure wool, his throne like a fiery flame, his wheels as burning fire. So he comes on the scene to take down these nations. Is that Yahweh Shai? No, it's the ancient of days. The one that sits on the throne. And like I said before, here's Yahweh Shai right here. And I saw in the night visions, verse 13, and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. And they brought him near before him. That was giving him dominion, glory, and the kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that should not pass away, and his kingdom that we should not be destroyed. That's Yahawashai right there. But what, what happened before that? Because they bring in Yahawashai from heaven. He's coming with the clouds, right? Came with the clouds of heaven. I saw in the night vision, behold, one like the with the clouds of heaven. He's coming with the clouds of heaven. What happened when he comes with the clouds of heaven? He's not going up to, to heaven. He's coming back with the clouds of heaven. And they bring him to the ancient of days. Ancient of days is already here. here. My internet is unstable at the moment, so notice some unstableness. Just hold on, just be careful. Hold on real quick. So the ancient of days is already here when Yahweh Shai gets here. The ancient of days is already to judge the nations. All right. Who's going to judge these nations? The ancient of days. I beheld to the thrones were cast down. The ancient of days did sit. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his hair filled with wool. His throne was, was, was like a fiery flame, and his wheels like a burning fire. In Revelation, it talks about this, these multitude of people, they have white robes on. So that's why you can see the ancient of days has a garment on white as snow. How did their garments get white? They came, they came out of great tribulation and washed them, washed them in the blood of the lamb. All right, let me highlight this right quick. But you see the father, which is the ancient of days, with a garment on white as snow. How did he get a garment white as snow, washed in the blood of the lamb, white as snow? Unless he also come down as a human being. All right, he has a body. He had come down and went through tribulation with his people. White as snow, garment white as snow. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered unto him. 10,000 and 2,000 stood before him. The judgment was set. Let me, let me highlight that. So who's the one that's doing the judging in the latter days? Let me highlight judgment was set. And he, this is the one that's going to be using his people to do judgment. There's no one said the books will open. But he's judging in the latter days before even Yahweh gets here. And he's on the earth physically with a white garment on. I beheld him because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld till the beast was slain, his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And we see right here in Revelation chapter 7, and it talks about that last beast, which is Rome. And Daniel says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. And the four this horn were plucked up, were, were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and the mouth speaking great things. So who was this little horn? The little horn has to be the Roman pontiff. This is the Roman pontiff, the, the Pope, that issued war against the Jews, the black Jews, the Negro Jews. It caused them to go into slaves. So the slave trade was really war 
but he basically was the one who began the slave trade because these Jews would not convert to Catholicism. Daniel 7, 21, I beheld the same horn, which is from Rome. What is the, what is the Pope called? The Roman Catholic Pope? I just said, I give you the answer. So he's a Roman Catholic Pope. That last beast is Rome. What did it become? The nation of Rome became a Catholic, it became a religious center. So through religion, they did war against the saints. Now the hell and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until, verse 22, the ancient of days came. Right here, did it say until Yahawashai came? Until the one like the Son of Man came? Did it say that? No. Who's coming? The ancient of days. <laughs> He's not coming invisibly or anything. Ancient days. So in order to come visibly, he has to be a human being. That means he would be in the earth becoming. And he would be, the reason why it says that the one like the Son of Man, we know that's Jesus. You notice it says one like the Son of Man? Because in the latter days, who's going to turn out to be the Son of Man? The ancient of days. The one that he's going to be before he becomes the ancient of days, he's going to be a Son of Man. See? That's why it says Yahweh is one like the Son of Man because this ancient of days is going to become the son of man. Before he's caught up and becomes ancient of days, he's going to be a son of man in the earth. Just like Yahweh was in the earth and then he got exalted in the heaven. Well, this ancient of days is going to be a son of man in the earth in the latter days. And then he's going to ascend. He's going to basically ascend, just like Revelation chapter 12 that speaks about uh, the woman that gave birth to the man child and he was caught up to God into his throne. There it is, right there. Now, that's not Yahweh is talking about. That's talking about the ancient of days. He kicks Satan out of heaven and he comes back down. When he goes up into heaven, Michael and those angels have power to kick Satan up out of there. When that happens, he kicks Satan up out of heaven. Satan comes down and occupies, possesses the Antichrist. When that happens, the ancient of days comes back down too to do some business. So I be held to the same horn made war with the saints. So this Antichrist would have to be somebody that Satan will occupy. He would be the Pope. I heard some people saying Pope, call him Pope. But he would be the Pope. I be held to the same horn made war with the saints and prevail against him. So who would be the one that was really right there ready for Satan to occupy and possess? It'd be the Pope. And he's basically already been waging war against Yahweh's people for years. But this time it's going to be something else. It says that it's going to be the time of great tribulation. So, so he's going to come down, Satan's going to come down, going to get kicked out of heaven by Michael and his angels. He's going to go down there and possess the Pope. The Pope is going to allow the Pope, Yahweh's going to allow the Pope to do a few little things. Then Yahweh's going to come down and take him out. I be held to the same harm, made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. All right. Then, when he gets possession of the ancient of days, I mean, possession of the little horn and kills him, then Yahweh comes. All right. So you can look at that. You can look at the ancient of days being like King David who gets the throne and the, the, the wages war and to bring the whole world under subjection to him. And you can look at Yahweh being like the son of David, Solomon, that reigns right after David is done. Yahweh would be like Solomon. The ancient of days would be like David. That's how it's gonna be. You know, Solomon was not a, war, a man of war, he's a man of peace. Same way, Yahweh is a man of, he's called the what? Prince of Peace. So this ancient of days is the one that does the warfare. All right? So what we're looking at is the beginning of this judgment of the Most High against these nations. All right? That's what's going on. You wonder what's happening? You never say, I never say, I'm going to be honest with you, I've been alive for, Blah, 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 so many years, I'm not going to say it right now. Just put it this way, round it off to 60. I've been around for 60 years. Uh oh, 
I mean, the gear to take this thing all the way out. Uh, and around, you can around it up to 60 years. But I've never seen anything like this before. Even when the, uh, even when the, uh, what is it called? The Black Panthers and Muslims and all of that were rising up, and civil rights movement and all of that. Never seen anything like this, a bunch of whoop ass taking place against these folks like that. All right. What did I say? Well, just look back, 2019, we was waiting on the affliction and all of that and our, the judgment and for y'all to come and get us after the 400 years of affliction. Well, what he's got to do is got to judge first. All that nation whom they will serve, will I judge? And afterwards, sure, they come out with great stuff. But when do we come out? After the judgment. When do we come out of here? After the judgment. The judgment, you're going to see the judgment. So if you're liking that, go back and look in the book of Exodus when y'all judged Egypt and then bought his people out. So that's similar to what's going to happen here. All right. Drake, did you have anything you wanted to say? Hmm? Picked up the Zoom. Picked up the Zoom. Want to try to get back on it? You have something to say? I'll wait. So that's what's going on, y'all. Look at it and see it and judge it. God's coming for his people. But my my uh, my warning is don't be the two, don't be the two-thirds that's gonna be cut off and die. All right. Don't be the two-thirds gonna cut off and die. You get cut off and die, be the one-third. And he says he's going to bring them through the fire, through the flame. All right. So that means you're going to go through some stuff, but you're still going to make it. Paul said he count all things but done that he may win Christ. That means he may win the kingdom. Because Christ is coming, basically, he's going to be reigning as Melchizedek during the kingdom age. All right. So he's going to be, it's going to be a time of peace. They won't be rising up, risings and all of that in the kingdom age of the other nations. All the nations are going to realize that Yah set his people that were slaves up above all the nations of the earth. You want to you wanna realize he set his people up that were used to be slaves and afflicted and by words among all the nations that, they, that these people are his people. All the nations are going to see that. All right, and I think, uh, what is that? Wisdom of Solomon it speaks about? That people are going to say, these, these people that we had in great derision, how, how is he now set above everybody? And the way, I think the book is called Wisdom of Solomon. It speaks about it. The people that they had in great derision now are set above all other people. And how much I said that the first will be last and the last will be first in the kingdom. That means the, the kingdom people will be, be the people that have been on the bottom, which are basically, guess who? The Negroes. Gonna be on the top forever, not just until another generation comes up, forever. That's why God took his, took his time, because this is gonna be eternal. It's not gonna be just for a while. It's gonna be it forever, it's gonna be everlasting. You know? Are you on there yet? Or did you wanna, did you want me to put uh, the mute?
Okay. Well, shalom, everybody. Uh, those near and far um, around the world that may be listening to this video. Um, my uh, father here asked if I had anything to say. And um, I did some praying. Yeah. I did do some praying about what to say on uh, certain things that I've been learning, learning and seeing as well. And uh, almost in the same vein, for the most part, what he's been teaching about, uh, especially today. And uh, um, kind of an elementary type of thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody has heard this in church if you grew up in church and you probably heard ecclesiastics um, 9 and 11 where it says uh, i think this is solomon speaking when he said i returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong neither yet bread to the wise nor yet riches to men of understanding nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Um, I'm starting to really, really, really day by day, I'm understanding this, this, uh, this portion of scripture. And I say all of that to say that uh, as, as believers in this faith, if you're in this faith and you're walking with the most high, seeking him, then you should know by now that every day is, is a battle. You know, we're in a constant, a constant war. And while I would say for starters, it kind of starts off for a war for your spirit, where Satan and Yahweh Shai are battling to, to get you as far as where you're going to be placed, which is basically eternal life or eternal damnation. And hopefully those that can hear have chosen Yahweh Shai. And now, now you have eternal life um, because without, without Yahweh Shai, there, there, there is no real eternal life. Um, there is a scripture where Yahweh Shai says and talks about keeping the law, where if you keep all the law and you would do well, you, you can get eternal life. But if, if you, if I'm being honest, I think it's easier. <laughs> it's quite easier to accept Yahweh Shai's white righteousness and the fact that he kept the law perfectly. And you didn't basically. Uh, we are blemished. We are blemished beings. He came as an unspotted lamb and died that way. So, upon accepting him, that is how you get you get you, uh, eternal life. Truly, something that I found interesting is when he starts talking about the kingdom. Unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom. It goes on to say, unless you're born to the water, you can't turn it. It is my thought that um, like he said, see the thing eternal. But by just keeping the law, I don't even think. Even if you have eternal life, he didn't mention that to the, the young rich ruler who came to him and asked him, what does he lack and what must he do to have eternal life? I notice how Yahweh Shai didn't mention that you can see the kingdom by king.
Uh-oh. I got kicked off. Well, I'm back on now. Uh, Jay says I'm breaking up bad. Um, okay. So let me let me know, Jay. I think this Duran, if you can if if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, is it still breaking up? Uh, not currently, no. Okay. Yeah, Jerron, he 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 told me he can hear me now. Um, I don't know what all was what all was heard. Uh, I mentioned Ecclesiastics nine, uh, verse eleven, where Solomon was explaining about the the uh, race. And basically, so you started breaking up probably the last two or three minutes. Okay. Um. So I was talking about. I, I know I started talking about eternal life, and I was making a contrast on the basically there's it's like there's some differences between two eternal lives, and also there's some differences on how to get into the kingdom, and let alone see it. When the rich young ruler uh, approached Yahweh Shai, he asked him, what must he do to have eternal life? And then they, he basically started mentioning the commandments and until um, the rich young ruler asked him, what, what like I get? And that's when Yahweh Shai told him to go sell everything he had and to come follow him. And then, of course, we know the story. The rich young ruler, he kind of left off really sad because he had many things. Um, what I have, what I think I've stumbled on is that Yahweh Shai mentioned that unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom. Um, and that, that means accepting him as your Lord and Savior and accepting him, uh, accepting his righteousness um, as a uh, acceptable unto God, unto the Lord in heaven. Um, that is how we get born again. Uh, we accept him as our Lord and Savior, of course. We accept that there's nothing that we can do on our own um, to, 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 to be born again. Um, and that, that, that is the way to be born again. But he also said that unless you be born of the water and the spirit, this is after you're born again, you can't even enter into the kingdom. And what I think I stumbled on is that Unless, yeah, unless you do those three things, um, it, it won't happen. So while he told the young rich ruler that if you keep the, those commandments that he mentioned, that he do a will, he, he'll see eternal life. But he won't, I don't think that rich young ruler would see the kingdom. Like he won't be, let alone enter it. He won't even probably be able to see it. This is a great just a great possibility. I'm still kind of in study on that. But really my main point behind all of this is the, the fact that we are constantly in war. Um, it is very important that we do as uh, I think it was Paul and, and Yahweh Shai who instructed us to, to walk in the spirit and, and not fulfill, fulfill, fulfill the flesh um, because the flesh is at enmity with God. It, it truly is. And I will say every little, every last little bit, um, even we have to watch our anger and the way we, you know, we take in certain things and the way we handle certain things. There is a difference between fleshly anger and spiritual anger. There really is. Um, and if we're not careful, we can get caught up in these things. And even as believers in Christ, those who have accepted Christ, what can happen is if you start walking in that flesh of anger, um, it, will, it will oppress you for a while. Honestly, in my personal experience, I have gotten dealt with as far as being angry and wanting to to fight and even for a good reason there are certain things that have, that has happened to me things that have been said that could have really tarnished 
my character and my business um, that I got really upset about, but I, I, I won't sit up here and act like I didn't hear the spirit tell me to, to let it go. And when I didn't let it go, I had to literally deal with it. It was almost like he allowed anger to take temporary possession in such a way. Um, but at the same time, I was able to seek him out and, and pray about it, that it would that be taken away from me, but it didn't happen right away. So obedience to the spirit and walking in the spirit is, is, is where the fight is. It's very important that it, it will not, you will not win and you will not overcome in this life uh, those obstacles that you know are in front of you um, and, and things that are even behind you trying to run up on you. You won't do that in the flesh. Everything has to be done by the spirit. You know, this Montgomery bar, brawl, I believe truly that that's just a manifestation of the spirit. Now, it, it did get violent. Um, but, you know, like David said, there is a time for peace and there is a time for war. It's, it's, it's all in the timing of the Lord, of the Most High, in God's hand. It's, it's, nothing is, is in our hand. And the more we, the more we uh, surrender, the more we surrender ourselves, our time, and everything about us to, to the Lord, not just surrender it and just keep it there. We have, to, we have to really tell the Most High that we give him authority and put it in his hands. Um, the better your life will definitely be when you really trust him. As uh, Hebrews, uh, let me see, I want to make sure I say that right because it's one of my favorite scriptures where it talks about um, without faith, it is impossible. Hebrews 11, verse six. Yeah, Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Uh, the second portion of this is what I really love. It says, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This is like almost like a commandment. God is basically telling us, Believe that I am God and believe that I will reward you when you dil diligently seek me. And that's one thing I love about God, though he's creator of all things. There's nothing that we can see, hear, feel, smell, taste, um, or any of those senses that we have that he did not have his hands on and create for us to be here. Though he is that, he's not a bully. He's not like a bully type type of person where you just better do what he says do no actually doing what he says do there's there's a blessing in it and the more you do it the greater your blessing will be the the greater blessed you will be i would say and you know there might be some things that you don't even know that is a true blessing that you know until he actually puts it on you and gives it to you so I say everything to say, be obedient to your creator, to, to the father in heaven, because he has your best interests. Not only does he deserve your obedience because you're a, a, create, a creation, you're a creature made from him. He took the time out to create you. Everything about you is special. You know, even just the palm of your hands. I, I like looking at my hands every now and again, and I just, you know, kind of observe, you know, the lining. There's some special lines in my hand that allow it to work. You know, this is this is true art right here. It's not just any old thing. You know what I'm saying? I'm not just any old person. I'm somebody special. And when I tap into the spirit, I'm starting to learn just how special I am. Um, everybody has a specialty. Everybody has something special about them. Um, but it's we'll only find out through, through the Lord in heaven, you know, through Yahweh Elohim, that is the only way, and through his son, Yahweh Shai Mashiach. So I say to everybody to trust, trust the most high, trust the most high with your life, and he will see you do everything. And I give all glory and honor to Yahweh Elohim and, and to his son, Yahweh Shai Mashiach, on that note, hallelujah and amen.
Yeah, I see it. All right, that was great. And uh, good work there. Um, I, as he was talking, I remember the scripture of Zechariah. We just looked at it a little earlier. I will bring the third part through the fire and refine them. Remember, verse 8, it says, And it shall come to pass and that in all the land, saith Yahweh, two parts there and shall be cut off and die, but the third should be left there. Not what I'm seeing here, I think the third is really the ones. They were born again and born of the water and the spirit. Because that goes along with overcoming. All right. And we're living in that day and time when this is going to happen. Who else would you think that third is? So what he's saying is correct. Where, where if you listen to my videos, you know that's what I teach all the time. That basically just keeping the commandments. And just like the rich young ruler. You keep the commandments, you're not born again, you're not filled with the spirit. All right. When this day comes upon you, you'll find out the hard way that she was not ready for the kingdom. And you don't want to be like that, all right? You want to take what we're saying as true, because it's written right in the word, right? Let me highlight this. That the one third that's going to make it has to be those that were really filled with the spirit, born again, filled with the spirit. If I was to tell you, just go along with people just to make them feel good, I would not be a proper servant of Yahweh. We don't speak things that make people feel good. I think there's a scripture that says, the wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy. So if it bothers you when I'm saying that you're just keeping the law itself, I'm not saying keeping the law is bad, but by itself and not being born again, not being filled with the spirit, all right? And you gotta learn what being born again, filled with the spirit is. Sometimes some of us Hebrew Israelites going to have to go back, talk to somebody in the church. Even though we don't want to, we might, we might want to go talk to somebody that knows about being born again and filled with the Spirit in the church. That don't mean you go and do what do what they do. That don't mean you go hang out and you, now you become a church member. Because when I got when I got born again and filled with the Spirit, I was not a part of anybody's church. All right. But when you get born again, as a radical change. There's a scripture that says, "Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible." When you're born again of, of of corruptible seed, that means you're keeping the law by yourself and you haven't been born again by Yahweh Shai's blood. And let me tell you, when you get born again by Yahweh Shai's blood, you change. There's a change. Now the law can can uh, the law of the Lord is perfect. The law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. Your soul can be converted. That means your mind, your intellect, and all that can be converted by keeping the law. But there's another incorruptible seed being born again. Of that incorruptible seed is when your Hawashai's blood washes your sins away and reconnects you back up with the Father. And that doesn't, you, you don't really have to be keeping the law for that to happen. But in order to get the kingdom, you must be keeping the law and be born again at the same time. I was not born again when God connected me back up to the Father. But he led me back to keeping the law and all of that stuff led me into being filled with the spirit. Being filled with the spirit is not just when you get on fire keeping, teaching about the law. Being filled with the spirit is when Yahweh's Holy Spirit comes upon you and it's radical. It's not something that you just, just think is, you know, you just got on fire when you start preaching. When you start talking about the Lord, you got on fire. No, it's radical. When you get filled with the spirit, go to Acts chapter two, you will see something different, something different happen. Now, before that happened, Acts chapter 2 in the Gospels, Yahweh Shai gave them power to, do, to heal the sick, raise the dead, and do all types of miracles. And they come back and said that they, even the devils were subject to them. But when they got filled with the Spirit in Acts chapter 2, that was something totally different, not the same ball game, y'all. All right? So 
just talking about the law and all of that and keeping the law and doing what you can is not incorruptible seed. You want to be born again of incorruptible seed, not of corruptible seed. Yahweh Shai done that thing perfect. When his blood touches you, then his righteousness takes your righteousness place. It's a different ball game. Now you be, now you have Christ, Yahweh Shai's righteousness on you, not your own. Yahweh Shai's righteousness is better than yours because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory. All right? Yahweh Shai's righteousness is perfect. It's like the law is perfect converting the soul, but Yahweh Shai's righteousness is perfect when it's applied to you. And I'm going to show you something real quick. Romans chapter 3 speaks about that. I was not even born again when that happened to me. In order to get born again, you have to be, you have to have your Hawashai's blood wash away your sin. But you can you can be converted by keeping the law. That's what we just read a little bit ago. You can be converted by keeping the law. I think it's a psalm that speaks about that. Converting the soul. But that's that's corruptible seed. You want to be born again of incorruptible seed. And I got born again, not even keeping the law. Before I even knew I was a I was an Israelite. Remember, I told you how Abraham, I saw him in the spirit, talking to somebody. And as I walked past them, I wasn't looking, I was tired. He spoke to that other person, said, This one also is my brew, also. This one is my brew, also. You just don't know it right now. All right. So when you get born again, you, this is supernatural. All right. And let's go here. Romans chapter three. I see why the Bible seems to be confusing sometimes. Therefore, by the deeds, Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is a lot of knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, verse 21. Watch this. But now the righteousness of God without law, without the law, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. We read that again. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. How could that be? Well, Yahweh Shai fulfilled the law for us. That don't mean you don't keep the law because there's some, there'd be some Christians from the church start doing do 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 dancing like pigeons in the water. Right? You know what I'm saying? You get the dancing and all that saying, they don't have to keep the law. Do 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 You know? No, that's not it either. That's not it either. Because Yahweh Shai said, many will come to me in that day, Lord, Lord. And when I prophesied in your name, cast out devils and done many wonderful works. Depart from me, you work of iniquity, I never knew you. The word iniquity means you work of lawlessness. So it's not about not keeping the law. When Yah filled me, when he gave me the born again life and filled me with the spirit, he led me to keeping the law. See, so both directions are wrong. If you want, you want to say that you don't have to be born again filled with the spirit, that's wrong. You won't get the kingdom because when that day kicks off, you won't have power. You won't have the righteousness of Christ and you won't have the power to get into the kingdom. All right, and the other way is wrong too, saying that you don't have to keep the law because you got the righteousness of Christ. He said he's gonna look at you and say, "Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, you worker of lawlessness." I never knew you. So both of those are wrong. What's the right way? To be born again, filled with the Spirit, keep the law. In other words, do it. You can start if you already know about the law, keep the law, but be born again and filled with the Spirit. And I'm gonna tell you right now. If you kept the law way before him, Israel was a whole nation that kept the law and still didn't get it 2,000 years ago. So you want to be careful about that because you might think that you already got enough by just keeping the law. That's being born again of corruptible seed. And when you're born again of incorruptible seed, you're born again because of Yahweh Shai is connecting you back up. Even though you're keeping the law, you've been born again. You've been, you got Christ, Yahweh Shai's righteousness, not your own righteousness from keeping the law. It's not saying you don't have to keep the law. As a matter of fact, you got to keep the law and be born again and filled with the Spirit to get the kingdom. But watch this. But now the righteousness of God without law, without the law, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So the law and the prophets spoke about this. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, and Yahweh Shaya unto all and upon all of them that believe. There's no difference. See that? So you want the righteousness of Yahweh Shaya upon you, not your own righteousness. Because we, we break the law all the time. Watch this. For all, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Watch this. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Mashiach, Yahweh. That means even after you've been redeemed, 
you still have sinned and, and broken his law and come short of the glory of God. Even after you've been born again, you still have come short. So you don't want your own righteousness, which is keeping the law, and just think that's going to get you the kingdom. It won't. And when that thing happens, like we were just talking about, the one third going through the fire, you're going to bring it through the fire and through the flame and all of that. If you're not born again, those people are going to, they're going to be cut off and die. All right? Now, hold on. Let me go back here. You're going to be cut off and die. So it is important. And uh, what happened was I, when I got born again, I took it serious. My mother and them come out of the church. And then I found that what they was talking about, they got filled with the spirit too. When I, I found out that that was real, that's no joke. Now, what I never wanted to be a part of was that whole church system. I, I never liked it. All right, I never liked the church system. So what I did, I asked God, fill me with the Holy Spirit at home. And he, and he did it, all right? I asked God to fill me with the And when I got born again, guess where I was at? At home. I wasn't in nobody's church. And, and I caught on to faith, and then God led a little lady there to lead me to the Yahweh with the rest of the world. I caught on to faith. But, you know, if you catch on to what I'm saying, and what my son Dre just said, you got the faith to get in there. You cannot, righteousness keeping the law is filthy rags. So you need the blood of your house to wash that unrighteousness away to connect you back up. Now you will have eternal life if you just did it without even being born again. But you, it's like the rich young ruler. He walked away sad because he had great riches. And Yahweh said, said, and the whole question was, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? That was the whole question the rich young ruler had. He, he didn't ask you, Yahweh said, what must I do? Good thing I, must I do to enter into the kingdom? He didn't ask him about entering into the kingdom. It was about what must I do to have eternal life? And Yahweh said, say, you're doing it. Basically, in a nutshell, you're keeping all the law. You've done this from your youth up. Do that and you will live, is what he told the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler then said, "What you know, all these things I've done for my youth, but what lack I yet? Then your house I turned around and said, oh, you want to know what, what you're lacking? He said, Did you take your riches, sell it, all that you have, give to the poor. You have riches in heaven, come and follow me. Why do you tell him to do that? Because the disciples, his followers, were going to get that Holy Spirit. We're going to be born again and get the Holy Spirit after his death and burial and resurrection. And that would get him into the kingdom. That's what he lacked. You want to be perfect. He said, if you want to be perfect, that's what, he, that's what he told him. He said, if you want to be perfect. In other words, just keeping the law by itself, you're not going to be perfect. The perfection comes from keeping the law, being born again and filled with the spirit. So when we see this, and I will bring the third part through the fire and we find them in Zechariah 13, verse 9. To find him as silver is, is fine and tried him as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say to you, how was my Allah high? Notice that the two thirds won't do that. They won't, they were gonna, you know, verse eight, it says, they shall come to pass and all the land say, how two thirds therein shall be cut off and die. What happened to them? Something happened where they weren't born again. They didn't get, they weren't perfect. They weren't perfect. So it's important. This is important. This is an important doctrine. I know a lot of people will say, no, he don't know what the heck he's talking about and all that. Listen, I do. I know what I'm talking about. I've, I've always been a person that kept it real before people was talking about keeping it real. I did not like church. I didn't like, I did not like gospel music. All that stuff, my father, my, my, cause my father was an evangelist, top rated evangelist at that. I didn't like all of that stuff going on. I didn't like on Sundays hearing us church music and church services on the radio. I didn't, I, you know, I was allergic to it. It's like, that's what it felt like, I was allergic to it. But one thing I did love, I love the truth, the truth about the Messiah. Whenever I saw a movie, Jesus movie come on, even though the person playing Jesus was white, I was interested. I was interested in movies about, and all of the stories about Jesus. You know, I was not sitting there listening to the sermons. I was interested in about the life. And I picked up a Bible before I got born again. I couldn't even read it. But I was interested in the portrayals of the Messiah and about God, the Ten Commandments. I was, boy, I was interested in those movies. So I was just like anybody else that didn't like the church system. And there's good reason to not like it. It's coming out of the people, coming out of a, 
a very demonic system that basically has tormented our people for over millennia. It took us into captivity and made us slaves over the last 400 years. And the church, the church music is nothing but sorrowful songs about that whole system. But I come to the realization that if I was going to be born again, God is going to have to save me. There was nothing I could do. Even if I tried to do good stuff, even though I kept the law, it was not good enough. And when I, when I come to that conclusion at age 16, that's when Yah sent a lady and she was sent by Yahweh. So she said, Yah told me that he had some people here. And, I, and he did because I had come to that conclusion. She led me to Yahweh in prayer with that, with that faith that Yah was going to have to save me, not me saving myself from doing good stuff, but he was going to have to save me, period. There was nothing I could do to be saved. That's when I got born again. Even keeping the law when I say it would convert my soul, I might have eternal life. But would you want to be one of the two thirds that get cut off and cut off and die at the restoration? Something's wrong with that. If you got good sense, you can see you can, you can tell, hey, so I don't want that. Because he's gonna deliver all of those people. Two, two, two parts then should be cut off and die, but the third should be left in. What was what, what happened to the third? They had to have been born again and filled with the Spirit. And remember in uh, Joel chapter 2, it speaks about that he's going to pour out the Spirit upon all flesh. Now remember, being filled with the Spirit, being born again and filled with the Spirit, and you don't keep the law, you still cut off. So that means there's going to be a lot of people in the church system that don't believe you have to keep the law. Even though they've been born again and filled with the Spirit, they're, gonna, they're not going to get, they're, they're going to die. And then those ones that of the Hebrew Israelite groups and camps, they're saying, we got we keeping the law and it converts the soul. We've got enough to get eternal life and the kingdom. They're going to be cut off. Two thirds. So that means the majority of the Israelites are going to be cut off. Only a, a third of them are going to be left. But let me let you go. It's for you to study and figure out and all of that. And uh, you have questions about salvation. You feel like as if you're ready to make that plunge. You understand it, that there's no being good enough to get into God's kingdom outside of the righteousness of Christ. You want to basically pray and be ready. You're, you're ready. Let me know. I've said a word of prayer before. Well, let me do it right now. Bow your head or touch the screen. All right. If you really believe this, that even though you kept the whole law, that you still don't have enough, you're still not perfect. It's because you're not. You need to be born again into an incorruptible seed. The only way that can happen is when you come to the realization that you got to, that he's got to save you. Even though you kept the law, he's got to save you. It's your Hawashite's blood that basically you want covering you, not your own righteousness. <clears throat> you want his blood covering you for salvation. And there's a change. So repeat after me, Father, I realize that it's your blood that basically the blood of your Hawashite that makes me perfect. Not my own, not my own righteousness. Not my own good works. Even though you approve of those things. But I want to be perfect. I want to enter into your kingdom. So save me now. Come into my heart. Apply the blood of Yahweh Shai to my life. Wash away my sins. And I will be clean. I can pray that you forgive me of all the sins I've committed all the blunders, all the things I've been hard-headed at, that, and make me yours, make me perfect for your king. By Sham Yahweh Shai Mashiach, I pray. Amen. All right, you said that word of prayer, and you really believe by faith, you, there's going to be a change. There's probably already a change happening in you. All right? When I got born again, when the lady led me in a prayer, I felt a little very, it was really amazing because there was something going on in the spirit. It was a, it was a warm feeling in my heart. And I knew something was happening. At first, I thought, oh, okay, right, let me say a word of prayer with this little woman. When she got to praying and, and the things started happening in the spirit, I was like, oh, Lord, something's going on. And it's good. All right? If something went on with you and it's good, all right, that's what we want. We want that born again nature where Yahweh Shai applies his blood to your sins. All right? And nothing can take that away from you. 
you cannot even send it, send it away, but you don't want to try it like that. All right? You want to go all the way with your house. Because if the righteous scared to be saved, what should the ungodly and the sinners appear? You don't want to go back sliding on him after he gave you his righteousness. All right? All right, let me let you go. Shalom, everybody. See you next week. Tomorrow's New Moon Day. So next week, it'll be on Wednesday. All right. Bye, Sham. Yahweh Sham, I approve of it. We'll be back here.